All right, welcome everyone. I'm Kelly Costello, Director of Programs and Events here at the Catalina Museum for Art and History. I'm super excited to relaunch First Fridays at the museum with our very first virtual event of 2022, the story of Two Pennies with Susie Miller. Before we hear from Susie, I wanna give you the chance to virtually tour our exhibition, Titanic, Real Artifacts, Real People, where you will get a look at those two pennies. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our deputy director and chief curator, Johnny Sampson, who will take you inside the gallery now. It is so great to see all of you in tonight's program. Um, I'm Johnny Sampson, as they've said, uh, deputy director and chief curator here at the museum. And I am thrilled to be bringing you along on a tour of our show, Titanic, Real Artifacts, Real People, Real Stories. So, um, most of you are familiar with the, with the story of the Titanic, uh, so what I'd like to do is share some of my uh, favorite artifacts from the show um, that tell the, the human side, um, the personal stories. So I'll flip this around and bring you all aboard our exhibition. So the show actually starts out even before it sails. We have here, this is actually one of the original launch tickets from when this was launched by Harlan and Wolf back in May of 1911. This is when just the hull was actually put out. They hadn't outfitted the ship yet. So fast forward to uh, uh, April of uh, 1912. We actually begin the show with Hilda Hellstrom. She is a third class passenger. Um, she was a Swedish resident, an immigrant coming to America looking for a better life, as many uh, third-class passengers were. It was a one-way ticket. What's unique about her archive is that it shows every single document needed to be on the Titanic. So we have here her ticket, her baggage claim, you can see right there with the 2929, um, her uh, doctor's note showing that she was healthy, um, and her visa. And then we also have some photographs of her, um, even one of her in later life. Uh, she did survive. Um, but what's unique about third class is uh, we have all these documents because she was third class. She kept all of her um, uh, valuables in her coat, and that's why uh, they still exist. So the Titanic was a Royal Mail steamer, RMS Titanic. We actually have uh, two um, of the mail clerks are focused on in this exhibition, both Oscar Scott Woody and Pat Williamson. Um, I'm going to focus in here on Pat Williamson's story real quick. Down in the lower right, you see the photograph of the young lady. That's Miss Gladys Copeland. Uh, he was sweet on her, actually, and he was uh, courting her. And she said if he were to get her a souvenir from the Titanic's maiden voyage, she would give him a kiss. I know times, times are different. In any case, in the middle there, you actually see the postcard he sent her from the Titanic. It bears the, the Titanic's postmark on it. She did receive her postcard. Unfortunately, he did not make it and he never received his kiss. The show is filled with heartbreaking stories, but also stories of courage and, um, and hope. Um, Oscar Scott Woody, who I just mentioned, um, like the rest of the mail clerks, uh, as soon as the ship started to sink, they started trying to save the mail. Um, this right here is a facing slip, um, one of the few that survived, but what would happen is after they realized that the ship was going to go down, they started putting the facing slips in their pockets, so when they got back to New York, they would show what mail was lost. Um, unfortunately, none of them, the clerks made it, and neither did any of the mail, but because this was in his pockets, they were able to see um, that even in his death, he was still doing his duty um, as, a, as a mail clerk. This is Thomas Miller, the archive for Thomas Miller. Susie is going to tell you so much more about this, and I'm gonna leave it to her to do so because she has such personal and uh, amazing stories. But what I do wanna show is that here, these two pennies are part of what we're talking about this evening. And it's just such, this, these are the two pennies um, that her great grandfather gave to her grandfather. And here, here's a picture of her. I know we'll be seeing more of her in just a minute, but I just, I can't, I can't help it. It's just such a beautiful archive um, and such a, a poignant tale. Um, and we'll talk about Thomas Miller in just another second, because I have a little bit more I want to speak about him. 
Here I focus on two different uh, letters um, by two men to their wives. Uh, one is William Harrison. Um, he was the secretary to Bruce Ismay. I don't have a picture of Harrison, so that he's being represented by Bruce Ismay there. And the other is Austin Partner. So their two letters are right here, side by side, each to their uh, respective wives. Now Harrison's talks about how you know he's working for White Star Line, he's working for, um, for Bruce Ismay, and he has to work until midnight, and there's not that many first class passengers. And if he never has to do this again, that's okay, that would be too soon. Where Austin Partner's letter starts off, and it's my dearest wife, you know, he's just heartbroken to leave her alone as he has to go. This is his 17th trip across the Atlantic, um, and he gets seasick, so he was really didn't want to go. Um, neither one of the gentlemen survive. Uh, what's interesting here, you can see those two pieces of jewelry. Each one were coins that were found in Austin Partner's pocket when he, when he was recovered, and his wife had them, his widow had them turned into jewelry that she wore uh, the rest of her life. Many of you are familiar with the story of Wallace Hartley and the band and how the band played on after, up until the final moments of the ship. Here is some actual of the sheet music that he had in his valise when it was recovered. So I'll spin around real quick just to tell the story here of um, Harold Bride. He was the assistant uh, Marconi operator. Here's one of the rare pictures from the Titanic um, that still exists. This is actually him in the Marconi, uh, in the Marconi room. Um, what we have here at the museum, and I really hope that you get an opportunity to come here, this is a working straight key. It is actually wirelessly transmitting, and it sounds similar to how as it would on the Titanic, um, which is an awful sound. So these guys were, you know, hitting this, this key, not this one, but trying to get that message out. If it hadn't been for the wireless operators, no one would have survived the sinking. Also of note, here we have an incredible uh, reproduction um, of, the, of the actual wireless key that was on the Titanic. This is lent to us by uh, Tom Pereira of the Enigma Museum, and it's just incredible. And then these are the actual Marconi grams going from the Carpathia to the Olympic and to the other um, other ships after the sinking. Another unique thing that we have here is this is the first time this technology has ever been used um, in a museum. This is through theatrical concepts. And we actually have a wireless, or excuse me, a hands-free device that I'm going to use here to explore the ship and show where people were on that final night. Here you can see up here, there is Officer Lowe on the fifth officer. Um, there's where Pat Williamson was in the mail room. So this technology has never been used in a museum before. The phone's giving it some interesting colors as it tries to correct, but... And then of course, we have the, uh, the Catalina Express there for scale, the Jet Cat Express. Just amazing, the size of this ship. This was actually the largest moving man-made object in the history of the world up until that time. It was one of the safest ships, or it was supposed to be, um, and it was just an incredible, incredible ship. Back to some of the personal stories though. Here we have, uh, from Ken Marshall, we have this beautiful life vest um, that was actually worn by one of the survivors. Here we have two lifeboat plaques. This is the first time they've been together since 1912. Absolutely incredible. And here, this, oh, this is just such a touching piece. This is from the second class passenger, um, Ada West and her husband. Uh, uh, he got them onto the lifeboat. Um, her and her two little, his two daughters. Um, one was uh, five or nearly five, and the other one was about 10 months old. He gets them on the lifeboat, and it's so cold, he runs back to his room uh, to get this thermos to fill it with hot milk. When he runs, comes back to the deck, the boat deck, the boat's being lowered. So the story is that he grabbed a rope and reached out, handed it to her, to his wife, um, as a final act of love, and then said goodbye. 
Uh, she never saw him again. She was actually pregnant at the time, and she named uh, her son Arthur West Jr. in his honor. Fifth Officer Lowe, um, you're familiar with the story, the James Cameron movie, uh, the officer that goes back with a flashlight looking for survivors. That's a true story, and this is Officer Lowe. He comes in again to our story in a second, but it's just, he was one of the heroes of the Titanic. Um, here is actually a collection of his postcards that he had of the Titanic being built that he actually collected before it sailed. And this is the full collection that he had in his scrapbook. Another archive is of Oscar Holverson um, and his wife. So they went on a, a, a trip to South America. He worked for a shirt manufacturer. They went on a trip. This is their itinerary, um, their tickets. So he went all through South America looking for his work, and she went along with him. Afterwards, just as a lark, they got on the Titanic just to come back on the grandest ship. He doesn't make it, um, but she does, and she you know, in the newspaper articles about it, she just, you know, there's nothing left. There's nothing left at all. And this brings us to the Minahans. So, Mr. and Mrs. Minahan were on the ship. They were first class passengers. Um, when the ship goes down, I guess this is where it all starts to tie together. So, Officer Lowe, commands lifeboat number 14. This is actually lifeboat number 14 right here. On that boat, um, or before he went back looking for other passengers, on the boat, that, on boat lifeboat 14 was Lillian Menahan. What's amazing about her um, is that this is actually her on Catalina Island. She survives. She ends up living here on the island during the World War II, um, which is just incredible. Speaking of lifeboat number 14, in this picture, taken four days before, while the ship is outside of uh, Queens, Queenstown in Ireland, this right here is lifeboat number 14, which four days before, everyone's walking on the grandest ship on the sea, having no idea that in just a few days, it will be out in the middle of the ocean all by itself. I realize I'm running out of time here, but I'll share. This is an actual bench from the Olympic, the sister ship to the Titanic. And that blanket that you see right there is an actual blanket that was wrapped around someone on the, on the lifeboats and then on the rescue ship Carpathia. We have instant disaster books that were made in 1912, right after the sinking. We have mementos and, uh, and, and cards we have Titanic relief fund checks that were sent to the, uh, the survivors or the uh, families of the victims to just try to help out in this uh, such a tragic time. We have an amazing collection from Tony Probst of the ceramics. First class, you can just see these amazing, this amazing china. So we have first class, second class, um, this is a set from the Café Parisienne. That's actually where Lillian Minahan uh, dined on the last night. Examples of the kosher sets. Some third class, um, even a chamber pot. <laughs> and another of the great personal stories right here, you can actually see the picture of James Kiernan in my shadow. Um, but this cup and saucer, this little coffee cup, before it sailed, while it was South, in Southampton, people could get on the boat and actually, you know, see the ship. So he invites his wife onto the, onto the ship, makes her a cup of coffee. This is the rarest of all the, the China patterns on the Titanic, you can see. There was only, you know, like, so many made by Spode. He has her have a cup of coffee, he gives her a tour of the ship, and then afterwards, she pockets it, takes it home. <laughs> so this purloined cup, uh, it's the only reason we have it, is that it was uh, taken off the ship. Um, of note, he does not make it, and for her afterwards, after the tragedy, um, she has to get a job, and she ends up working for White Star Line as a stewardess, similar to what he had been doing before. So Vintage did a revival. 
has provided us with some amazing uh, uh, recreations, digital recreations of first class, second class, third class dining, the grand staircase, and the Turkish bath. Um, and speaking of the Turkish bath, here's an actual ticket from the Turkish bath, just showing the luxury that was the Titanic. I want to thank you all for, uh, for joining me. Um, it's such a treat to, to have you here um, tonight for tonight's event and also just for, um, I, I really hope that you're able to come see this show. It's a beautiful exhibition and we have it until February 13th before it goes back to its collectors. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to Johnny for um, putting that together and going through the exhibition. If like Jill Car Carlier said, uh, if you haven't been here, uh, our exhibition is here until uh, mid-February, uh, February 13th to be exact is the last day. Um, we're so glad that we could actually extend it so everyone could hopefully come and see it uh, since we did open it in 2020 in all of the craziness that was. And uh, so we're thrilled to be able to extend it and keep telling more stories. Of course, the stories related to Titanic are endless and emotional and uh, really heartfelt for the mo usually and just sometimes heartbreaking. And uh, so one of those stories that we're gonna share today is uh, Susan Miller's uh, family story. And we're so thrilled to have her here um, just to give you a little bit of a background on Jill before we turn it over to her or I'm sorry, to Susie before we turn it over to her. Uh, she actually is the president of the Belfast Titanic Society and the great granddaughter of Thomas Miller, who was the Titanic's assistant deck engineer. She's a former television news reporter and she started a Titanic themed tour in Northern Ireland in 2008. Uh, she was a guest lecturer also on board the Titanic Memorial Cruise in 2012. Uh, she and her husband, David, uh, split their time between Belfast and the U.S., uh, but when in Belfast, they live in the home formerly owned by the Titanic's chief draftsman, Roderick Chisholm. So she is tied to the Titanic in a few different ways, and we couldn't be more thrilled to have her here. Um, she's actually in the U.S. right now, um, but out on the East Coast, so uh, we appreciate her joining us this evening. It's a little later for her than most of us. And so I'm happy to um, welcome and turn this over to uh, Susie. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gail. Lovely introduction. It's it's nice to see you folks at uh, Catalina Island again. Uh, we were out there with you, I think it was November time, uh, just to see the exhibition and uh, to have a look at the pennies, which I hadn't seen for a couple of years. So um, you've done a lovely job there. You really have. And for anyone who hasn't had the chance to get out to Catalina, I, I thoroughly recommend that, that you try to do so. It's lovely to see uh, some old Titanic friends and some new ones as well. And also uh, thank you to the members of, of Catalina Island Museum for, for tuning in as well. Uh, there are some adventures that, that uh, I recognize a few names um, who've been with me in Belfast to tour around the various Titanic sites, uh, including one where we nearly got locked in a cemetery when it was closing for the evening. So that's a tale for another day anyway. Um, I think, you know, what I have to tell you tonight really is a family story. And as Gail was alluding to, I, I think that the, the story of Titanic, while of course it's the story of a ship, is more importantly the story of people and, and individual people. And uh, in my case, it's just the story of an ordinary Belfast family who got caught up in, in events that became so famous in history. So it takes you through the, the story of my great grandfather and why he was on Titanic and what happened to him. And then what happened to us as a family afterwards uh, and takes us right up to, to the present day. So um, hopefully it's something that, that you'll enjoy uh, hearing about. And with that, I'm gonna start to share my screen with you. So just bear with me one minute while we get this. Here's our main man. Uh, the picture that hopefully you're seeing there is, is Tommy Miller, my great grandfather. So he's my father's father's father. So straight up uh, the paternal line, looking very dapper in this photograph. And I guess, you know, we're, we're quite lucky to have um, a couple of photographs of Tommy um, at a time when not everybody had access to a photographer's studio. And um, actually, the, the second one that we have of him, I think he looks entirely different. Um, the second one that you're looking at now is one that was taken for the Institute of Marine Engineers, 
when I started to to research my great grandfather's history and you know hearing that he was the assistant deck engineer on Titanic, I didn't really know what that meant and what his uh, role would have been. But when I found out that he was a member of the Institute of Marine Engineers, I think that that sort of guided me towards the fact that he was a quite a qualified man and that he, as well as being involved in the shipyard, was also going and training and developing his engineering skills uh, throughout his career at Harland and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast. So, you know, he wasn't just a deckhand, he, he was so much more than that. So um, central to our story is, is this lady here. Uh, she is my great grandmother, Jeannie, uh, formerly Ruddock, and then more latterly Miller. And uh, she uh, became Tommy's wife. The one thing I always point out about this photograph is this little narrow waist that she has, uh, which I'd love to say is genetically inherited, but it is not. Uh, she's probably very corseted into that dress, which makes her look a lot thinner than she was. But uh, it always struck me as a very austere photograph in which she looked quite frightening. Uh, but actually, uh, she was a, a quite a, a soft woman, as you'll see from the next photograph. She's, she's in black, I think, in this photograph because she's in mourning for her mother, who would have died around the time that she was a teenager. But here she is a little bit later in life. And as you can see, she's kind of softened in her looks and her demeanour. She's central to our story because what happens to her is what happens to um, Tommy. You know, what, 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 what happens to her in her life informs what happens to the Miller family more, uh, more widely. So that is Jeannie Miller, uh, my great grandmother. She was born in 1879. This is her little um, baptismal certificate from back in that time, reordered in 1898 because that was just before she was getting married. Uh, it tells us a little bit about her. As I say, she was born in 1879 and she lived in a street in Belfast called Trafalgar Street. And uh, I'll show you what remains of that. Not very much these days in Belfast. That is all that remains is the street sign for Trafalgar Street down at the docks area of Belfast. There's been so much redevelopment in that area of the city. Uh, what used to be called Sailor Town has been sort of ravaged by um, big highways going through it. So this street, Trafalgar Street, which used to be a big main thoroughfare going all the way through uh, from the docks right up uh, into a residential area of the city, um, <clears throat> is, is now no more really. It's, it's, it's just a, a sort of thoroughfare. This is the, the, the uh, church in which my great grandparents got married at the turn of the century. It's called St. Mary's Church. It's on the Crumlin Road in North Belfast. Uh, a very warm and pretty looking inside with its Christmas tree up there from a couple of years ago. Uh, because Tommy and Jeannie um, would have got together around about uh, the late 1890s, I believe. By that stage, my uh, great grandfather, Tommy, had had a, a few jobs within uh, the industry of shipbuilding in Belfast. His family came from a town called Bonnie Before, which is about 15 miles outside of Belfast on the County Antrim uh, coastline. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But he had come up to Belfast, obviously, because that's where the work was. And he started his um, apprenticeship in the smaller shipyard. Uh, some of you may know that there were two big shipyards in Belfast. And he started in Workman Clark and uh, then went off to uh, work in Vickers, which is over in England, in a place called Barrow in Furness. And then he came back uh, to restart his apprenticeship with Harland and Wolf. So he was working his way up the ladder of Harland and Wolf um, at the time when he met and married um, Jeannie. So out of that marriage came these two little boys. My grandfather is the younger of the two the little boy who's sitting down wearing a sailor suit, um, sitting on the chair there. And beside him is his older brother, Thomas Jr. So you've got William Ruddick Miller sitting down there, uh, my grandfather, and beside him, his brother, Thomas Jr. There's a six year age gap between these two boys, which I think is evident from that photograph. And it's an age gap really, which was never really made up. Uh, they were very different in their personalities. They were very different in how they reacted to things. And, uh, you know, maybe it's because of that gap in their age or just um, totally different personalities. My grandfather was born in 1907. So by the time Titanic is making an appearance, uh, he would have been four or five. And uh, you can see from this his birth certificate. Yes, he was born in 1907 and his father was a carpenter. 
<coughs> excuse me. <coughs> but by the time we get to the census in 1911, uh, you can see that his father on the right hand column there was a fitter. OK, so the, here's our, our 1911 census, which just gives us a snapshot of my little family back then. Any of you who've got uh, roots in Ireland or even anywhere else in the UK and have done any um, research into your um, <clears throat> genealogy will be familiar with these uh, census returns. It tells us quite a bit, but as I say, the most important uh, is that by this stage of the game, Tommy was working as a fitter in Harland and Wolf. So he's worked his way from carpenter to fitter. He's, he's been making his, his uh, improvements as he goes. The Miller family at this stage of the game lived in a little house, a little bit like this. They lived in Hillman Street, which is in the, the north of the city. Belfast underwent a huge expansion around uh, the late 19th century into the 20th century, built on the fact that they were producing not only ships for the world, but also linen and many other industries which were feeding into those two main ones. So you had lots and lots of people coming in from the countryside areas and needing to be housed. So lots of these late Victorian uh, row houses were, were put up in this red brick all over the city to, to house these families. And quite often uh, you would have more than one family living in a house like this. This is what's known as a parlor house. Uh, some of them were called kitchen houses where you just came straight off the street into the main room. And the census returns tell us that sometimes you had as many as, as 15 people living in, in little houses like this. It's a two up, two down. In other words, two rooms downstairs and two rooms upstairs. So we weren't too bad with only five people living in ours, um, but uh, some had, had many, many more occupants. This house um, is a little bit further up the street from where my great grandparents would have lived. Their original house, number 27, unfortunately was a casualty of the Blitz back in 1941 uh, because of those industries that I mentioned, the shipbuilding, and by that stage, the aircraft industry. Belfast was a target for the German bombers back then. So a lot of the housing stock in and around the docks area in particular was destroyed. So it's about um, a half hour walk from the shipyard. And uh, Tommy, I'm told just to leave the house uh, before six in the morning so that he could be in for 6.30 to start his day in Harland and Wolf. Now, let's just move you on. <clears throat> so our main narrator for uh, the story, I have to tell you is my great grandfather, or my grandfather rather, and this is him again, this is William Ruddick Miller. And as I told you, he was only, you know, four, four or five when all this was happening with, with Titanic and his father uh, being involved in the construction of it. But he was like a, a little sponge, really. He was absorbing everything that was going on in the house, everything that his father talked about. And it's something that he committed to paper uh, back in the 1930s when he was a bit more grown up himself and uh, when he became a published author. So he was watching the comings and goings of that house. He was watching his father going off to work so early in the morning and listening to him when he came back uh, to eat his evening meal with the family and listening to how proud he was of being one of the team that was helping to build the engines, first for Olympic and then for the RMS Titanic. And, um, you know, he spoke with such great pride about what Belfast was contributing to the world in building these, uh, the biggest ships that the world had ever seen. So this little lad standing here on a chair, my, my grandfather, was taking it all in and remembering it. So when he came to write, um, because he, he became quite a successful author in the 1920s and 30s, one of the things that he decided to write about was his early childhood. And I'm glad that he did because it gives us this insight and this snapshot into how the Titanic sinking was going to affect him. So what I'd like to do is just lead, read you a little bit about what my grandfather here wrote um, in 1934 when he was looking back on his childhood. And he's written it in the third person uh, in a typical Northern Ireland and Ulster man style. He doesn't want to reveal his own feelings and he doesn't want to let the author know that this is his own story. So he's referred to himself as a little boy called Owen. And when I read you this, this little extract, you'll realise that, that when he talks about Owen, it, it is himself. So here we go. He writes, 
There were certain things which Owen could remember about his ma. Little cameos which photographed themselves on his mind and later became part of a sacred album in his heart. For instance, there was the affair of the little wooden man. His father would amuse himself at the shipyard during his lunch break by carving little figures out of wood with his pen knife. With the result that when Ma went to sugar Owen's tea, there, lo and behold, was a little wooden man lying on the spoon. How did it get there? Owen's brown eyes would blink with astonishment. The fairies must have put it there, Ma would lie. And Owen firmly believed that until one day he accidentally witnessed one of the burial ceremonies. And then it was his Ma playing the mouth organ after breakfast. Before the dishes were cleared away, she would lift down her French fiddle from behind the china dog on the mantelpiece, put it to her fresh young lips and make real melody. And suddenly, out of the joy that was in her, she would raise her voice in one of the popular songs of the day. Singing when she should be washing her step, Mrs Johnson would sneer next door. But Jeannie knew it was good to start the day with a song, and her step was as clean as any in Hillman Street. So fond memories there from this little boy of his mother and father and uh, this life that they were leading. I don't know too, too many women who would send their brood out in the morning with a, a blast on the mouth organ and a song, but that seems to have been Jeannie's way of, of coping with the hardships of life. And as she watched her husband head off for these long shifts at Harland and Wolf, uh, where he was working so hard. Ooh. There's a little snapshot also into Tommy. I'm, I'm still finding out stuff about him. And uh, if you look at this record here, the third name down reads T. Miller. This record happens to be uh, what we call the Fines book. And it's something that we in the uh, Belfast Titanic Society managed to rescue from uh, the demolition of a lot of the buildings along the Queens Road where Harland and Wolfe shipyard uh, still is today. And uh, at that stage of the game, there wasn't much reverence given to the fact that they had built uh, the Titanic and the Olympic class liners. And so old historical documents tended just to be discarded. So we were lucky enough to be able to rescue this uh, fines book, which dates from 1910 through to 1912. And lo and behold, Tommy gets a mention in it. So fines books means that this was uh, a record of people who were fined part of their wages for various misdemeanors. At this stage of the game, we can see that uh, this T. Miller was an apprentice fitter and that he's fined a half day's pay. Uh, what it doesn't show here is what he did to deserve that. And his crime was to boil his can or make himself a cup of tea at uh, 10 past eight in the morning. You weren't allowed to have that first cup of tea until 8.30, so he jumped the gun by 20 minutes. The foreman must have seen him and uh, he was written up for this half day's fine. I hope he got to drink some of the tea at least because this was a, a December morning back in 1910. So uh, I'm sure he needed to warm up. Uh, but it's amazing how he manages to come through the, the pages of history and just make himself known to me in these little documents such as that. And then um, there's a very famous photograph of a section of the Harland and Wolf workforce standing uh, in front of the hull of Titanic. You probably know this, there's about 50 or 60 people in it. Tommy there is right in the middle of it, as if he's the captain of the team, as if he has single-handedly built Titanic's engines himself. So um, it wasn't until quite recently that touring uh, some people around in the drawing offices of Harland and Wolf, a lady said to me, isn't that your great-grandfather there? And, you know, with all these facial recognition techniques, I'm sort of 90% sure that, that it's him. So once again, he manages to, to call out through the pages of, of history. Uh, to me. Okay, so you're thinking, you know, we're 10 minutes in here and we haven't even seen the Titanic. So here it is, not to disappoint you. This is Titanic, the very famous photo photograph of her on the slipways. Uh, one of the famous Robert Welsh uh, collection of photographs from National Museums Northern Ireland. And um, what I love about this photograph is to be able to tell you that when Titanic was shoved off of this slipway at the end of May 1911, she was the biggest man-made object ever moved. Now that's an amazing statistic to get your head around that a little place like Belfast on the very edge of Europe was building these huge ships at the forefront of technology and innovation. 
And as I said to you, Tommy was, was so proud to have been part of that team. It was around about this time, I suppose, that Tommy started to think about why these ships were being built and what they were doing for people. The fact that to all intents and purposes, although they were carrying the rich and famous across the Atlantic Ocean, they were also immigration ships taking lots of people from Europe across to new lives in the States and in Canada. And I suppose it started to enter his consciousness. Well, why? You know, why are they going? What is so good about the promised land out there that they're uprooting their entire families? And you've got to remember also around this time, there was a lot of unrest on the island of Ireland. There was talk of um, a shared island, that the, the, the island would be annexed under one parliament in Dublin. And a lot of people in the north part of Ireland, which was so much more industrialised than, than the rest of the island, weren't in favour of that economically. They thought that that was going to be a bad idea. So maybe some of those thoughts were going through Tommy's head as well when he decided that he was going to make um, inquiries about joining the crew of White Star. So in other words, instead of being an engineer for Harland and Wolfe, and being involved in the construction of the ship, he was going to be a seagoing engineer instead. So if he discussed this with Jeannie, um, she didn't seem to be too keen on the idea because she was happy enough in her little home in Hillman Street. But um, what happens early in 1912 really changes the course of things because uh, in mid-January of 1912, Jeannie died. Jeannie died at the age of 33 from tuberculosis. So that left Tommy with two young kids and uh, he began to think that, well, yeah, the, the best opportunities would be across the water in uh, the United States. So <clears throat> he went to see this man. You might be familiar with him. This is Thomas Andrews, who was the chief naval architect of Titanic and who would have been way, way senior to my Tommy in the rankings of things. So I can only imagine the, the trepidation that was in my great grandfather's um, heart when he knocked on Thomas Andrews door one day and asked him for a reference which would secure him a position within the White Star Line. The decision he had made was that he was going to relocate himself and the two boys over to New York City. And the way he was going to do that was to become part of the transatlantic liners crew and base himself over there. Uh, so he was still going to be involved with the White Star Line, still be a, an engineer, but just on the other side of the Atlantic. So he needed a, a good reference to secure that position with the White Star. And uh, Thomas Andrews was the man to give it to him. That's a piece of paper I wish I could show you, but obviously it went to White Star. Uh, so um, some of it is family folklore. I'm going to say it's a true story. So you can just run with it with me on that. So whatever Mr. Andrews wrote on that piece of paper was enough to secure Tommy the position of assistant deck engineer. He did a quick voyage over to Antwerp with the Red Star Line, um, a ship called Gothland. And I suppose that was in preparation for what lay ahead. And then his second voyage he knew was going to be on board Titanic. This is a lovely photograph, I think, of Titanic. And she's sitting here at uh, the fitting out wharf at the end of the Queen's Road in Belfast. So. You've got in the foreground here the gate of the dry dock where her propellers were, were put on. But at this stage, she's still uh, sitting and fitting out. And you can see that they're still working a little bit around the bridge area here um, on the third funnel there and, and a few other places where she's still getting some work done. This man who's walking across uh, the dock gate is, is Bruce Ismay, um, as far as I can tell. So he was obviously in Belfast checking up on his his order to see how things were going. And it's in this position that my grandfather first saw the Titanic. <laughs> I see Dave giving it a good look with his uh, magnifying glass there. <laughs> Just run with me, I, everything I tell you is true. <laughs> so um, my grandfather, bear in mind, he was only four coming five at the stage when Titanic would have been in its uh, fitting out stage. And uh, his father took him down to see the ship one Sunday when the shipyard would be open for people to come and see what was going on. Because Tommy um, Senior wanted to explain to his two children what was going to be happening. So he took them to see the ship and explained that he was going to be helping, as he said, to make it go. And uh, that he was going to head off to New York by himself to begin with. And then once he would got there, he would send for the two of them and they would begin this new life. I suppose in the shock of his wife's death, he wanted this change of scene. He wanted to, to have this split 
uh, where he would begin a new chapter of his life with his two boys. So um, my grandfather remembers this moment very well when he first saw this huge big ship. He said it was so big that he couldn't understand what it was. He had expected a ship to be something you could see at one, you know, with one glance. But this was just, he said, like a big street of towering, frightening buildings. And he said to his father, I don't understand how it's going to stay up in the water. So that was quite a, a prophetic thing for a, such a young child to, to be able to think about Titanic at that stage. Eventually, then, the day came when Titanic was leaving Belfast. <clears throat> this was the 2nd of April, 1912. Um, no passengers. Some say there was one passenger on board, so we'll go with that. Um, but just basically the delivery run uh, to take Titanic from Belfast over to Southampton. And this was the day, clearly, that Tommy had to say goodbye to his two children. He took them to one side just before he boarded the ship. And he told them to be good for their Aunt Mary, who was going to be looking after them. And he said that he would see them again in a few months time. And this is where those pennies come in, because at that stage, he gave my grandfather and his brother each two new pennies from 1912. He'd specifically gone and sourced the pennies from that year so that they would have them as a little souvenir of the occasion. And uh, he pressed them into both of the boys' hands and he said, uh, here you go. These are two pennies from this year. Don't spend them until we're all together again. Keep them until uh, we're all reunited. So my grandfather remembers having those pennies pressed into his hand and then watching as his father boarded the ship and then he was gone. Titanic had her sea trials out on Belfast Loch here all of, of the day of 19, of, uh, sorry, the 2nd of April. And then she left that evening. My grandfather would have been standing on the shore just about where my arrow is. And that's where the, the little town of Bonnie before it would have been. And he watched as she sailed out that evening. He was allowed to stay up that little bit later. Um, he reckoned he could see his father on the deck of Titanic. You can see there's a few figures there along uh, the stern around about the flag. There's no way that he would have seen his father. I've stood in the same places and I've watched the ferries and the cruise ships that might come and visit us in Belfast as they come and go. And there's just no way it's too far out to be able to make out anybody on a ship with a naked eye, let alone any sort of amplification through binoculars. But he wanted to think in his five year old head that he could see his father sailing away. His comment about that was that he couldn't understand why all the people were cheering, because for him, this was a very sad occasion. Uh, to see the ship leave Belfast Loch and uh, goodness knows when he was going to see his father again. But he said that he had his two pennies clutched so tightly in his hand that the date of 1912 was nearly burnt into his palm. So you can imagine that for a little soul standing on the beach there as the light was starting to fade and um, clutching those two pennies was the only thing that he had to um, link him to, to his father and this within just weeks of the death of his mother. So the village of Bonnie before uh, looked something like that. In fact, I still believe that that big pothole in the middle of the road is, is still there. Um, our house is up here, the little thatched cottages. And this is where Mary Miller uh, lived with her brood of eight children. So she was taking in uh, Tommy Jr. and my grandfather for the duration of, of their father's adventure on Titanic. With um so many under one roof, she probably wouldn't even have realised that the, she had two more to feed. The house is still there. That's how it looks today. Still thatched. Um, people come and stay in it now. And I'll show you a picture later on of us as a family standing outside it. Um, <clears throat> it, it is a, a lovely little typical Irish cottage, I suppose you could say. And there's Aunt Mary standing at the door of the cottage back uh, in about 19, probably the 1920s. So, yeah, she had taken them in. Uh, she was widowed herself and uh, she, I, I'm told by the family that this was the only place that they would have been able to, to go to. They would have had to have been brought up by Millers was the quote that I got. Even though Jeannie had um, sisters and brothers in Belfast, they could have stayed closer to home. It was decided that they should go here for the duration of, of Tommy's uh, Titanic adventure. And I suppose it was a good place to be because it was by the sea and in the countryside and good fresh air. And uh, as far as the Miller family knew, everything was going great 
on board Titanic. I'd love to tell you that, that Tommy was writing letters home to tell them how things were going, but uh, I suppose he was learning his new job still and he wanted to keep on top of that. So he didn't put pen to paper either when he got to Southampton for the layup there or, or during the, the journey before they, they stopped at the last port of, of Queenstown in the south of Ireland. And so the first that the, the Miller family knew that anything was wrong, here's Mary again, uh, was when the newspaper headlines started to come back about what had happened to Titanic. And initially uh, the thought that most people had been saved. But then over the course of the next few days, it became obvious that that was not the case. And that uh, uh, in fact, fact two thirds of the people had, had um, um, perished. perished. I'm hearing, hearing myself. I'm not sure what you're hearing, hearing right now. Right I just want to continue on and hope that it goes well. So, so um, Aunt Mary was engaged with a young two young boys that uh, their father had died, that they were now orphans, that there was no trip to New York, that they were going to have to stay with her. And that was a pretty tricky thing for her to have to tell them, so much so that she actually chickened out of, of the whole operation. My grandfather used to spend a lot of time down on the beach at Bonnie before. This is a modern day picture of where he would have been. So you're seeing um, over on the right hand side that that's Carrick Fergus Castle, uh, which is also depicted on uh, the cover of the book. And then you're looking out uh, back towards uh, to the south to Harland and Wolf Shipyard. You can see the cranes that are there today of, of Samson and Goliath still working for Harland and Wolf today. When he was looking at that scene in 1912, he would have been able to see Britannic, the third ship in the line under construction, under the, the Arrow Gantry, which is just to the right of the, um, the Harland and Wolf cranes today. So anyway, this is a place where he liked to be because he could paddle in the sea and he could have all sorts of adventures. And one of the things that he liked to do to pass the time was to make his own little ships. So he was copying what his father had been doing up in Harland and Wolf by making his own little boats out of pieces of paper. So he'd fold them up the way you do and he would float them down the stream and into Belfast Loch here. And he spent a lot of time doing that. He was interrupted um, one day when he was doing that because his cousin Ella decided it was time that he found out what had happened to his father and to Titanic. And again, it's a little chapter of his life that he committed to paper when he was writing about this uh, later in his life. So we'll go back to the narrator of Owen and I'll read to you what he writes about how he found out about Titanic's fate. He writes, Owen watched his own small paper boat sail slowly and serenely down the river, which separated the village of Bonnie before. An aunt there had agreed to take care of the boys while their father was away at sea. And besides, a spell in the country would do them good. Cousin Ella approached and there was a worried, almost frightened look on her face. She was just in time to see Owen's frail craft hit a rock, quiver for a moment, fill with water, and then sink or rather sag into the river. And some of the terror faded from her eyes. Owen gazed at his late liner, now merely the page of an exercise book. So your wee boat sunk, Ella observed, and Owen nodded sadly. Ella paused and then blurted out, do you remember the big boat that your dad sailed away on? Again, Owen nodded. Well, it went the same way as your wee boat. It hit an iceberg. A lot of people drowned. Your da was drowned too. Owen was silent for a moment and then asked, then will my da ever be home again? No, Ella said, he won't be home ever again. And his gold watch too, Owen asked. Yes, that too, said Ella. Owen was hurt about the gold watch. It was a pity about his da, of course, but an even greater pity about the gold watch. Such a lovely one. Come on home, said Ella, and your brother will make you another wee boat. No, said Owen vehemently. I hate boats. And he meant it. My grandfather's just added a little postscript to the story in which he says that out in a part of the Atlantic where the sea was like a mirror and the spirit of God brooded upon it, a little wooden man floated just released from the ice cold hand which had held him. Maybe a little melodramatic, um, you know, to refer back to those 
little wooden men that uh, Tommy used to carve for his sons. But at the same time, bringing the reader back to the fact that Tommy, um, in his last hours on board Titanic and his last minutes, would have been thinking about his sons undoubtedly, and the fact that in trying to give them a better start in life, he'd actually ended up leaving him orphaned through no fault of his own. What was Tommy doing in those last hours on Titanic? Well, you know, as an assistant deck engineer, he and another Belfast man called Henry Philip Creese uh, would have been working shift about in things like um, maintenance of lifeboats and, and the davits which held them and the cranes which lowered them and basically anything mechanical up on deck level. So it's very possible that he was helping to lower lifeboats at, at the end. It's also possible that uh, because he had knowledge of how the engines were put together, that he was called below to the engine rooms to, to try to give some sort of help there. And we just don't know. Um, nobody has reported seeing him in those final hours and, and what he was doing. But, uh, you know, I'm sure he must have known for a long time um, that he wasn't going to make it into one of those lifeboats. So it would have been a, a terrifying time for him and just trying to, to get on with his job. So um, Ella, who broke that news so gently, really, to my grandfather, she and he remained friends throughout their, their short lives. This is Ella sometime in the 1930s. Um, she died quite young, but uh, he never forgot how she had couched, I suppose, the news that she had to break to him. Um, about what had happened to Titanic. And here's my grandfather a little bit later in life uh, with his, um, <laughs> I, I love this photograph because of what is written on the back of it. And I'll tell you that uh, he refers to uh, his wife in this photograph. He talks about my, my grandmother, whose name was Etta. And on the inscription on the back is to Etta from the thing behind my handkerchief. So, you know, he's he's a sentimental soul, but he tries to couch it. And I think that's what he's doing with his, um, narrative there where he talks about oh, asking about the gold watch he's just trying to, to lighten the the tension of the moment by making himself out to be in some way avaricious wondering about what happened to that gold watch I wonder too so that's my grandfather a little later in life when we began the presentation I showed you a photograph of the two boys when they were young children in the photographer's studio there and this is the only photograph I can find of the those two titanic orphans as they became in later life, uh, my grandfather on the right hand side of the picture and my um, great uncle Tommy Jr. standing to the left. It doesn't seem as if they spent any significant time together in adulthood. <clears throat> my grandfather, as I mentioned, working as a writer, working in newspapers at night time, working in theatre at night time, whereas Tommy, his brother, working for Harlan and Wolf, and he was a, a cabinet maker there all through his days until his retirement um, when he was in his, in his 60s. So uh, maybe they didn't have time to cross paths, but I just think that they were very different. Whereas my grandfather was prepared to talk about his parents and what had happened in particular to his father, Tommy Jr. just clammed up. He, he just wouldn't speak about it at all. Um, the next generation is there also. The little boy between them is, is another Tommy. We're very imaginative with names in our family. So he's Tommy the third, standing between them. I think that um, Tommy Jr. looks like Stan Laurel in that photograph. He always reminds me of Stan Laurel. But yeah, some sort of forced Sunday school lighting, I believe, is, is taking place in that photograph. So how did um, Aunt Mary manage to bring up two extra mouths uh, that she had to feed and, and keep unexpectedly? Well, the answer comes in several different formats. Uh, because they were entitled to certain um, compensation because of the loss of their father. This is a little extract from the Irish Freeman's Journal, um, which talks about a court ruling. Uh, this was sent to me by, by Senna Maloney, for which I'm very thankful, because it does add something to the, the story, I think. It tells you that um, the, the two boys, represented by their Aunt Mary, uh, went to court to claim a sum of £300, which had been lodged in court. Uh, because of the death of their, their father, Thomas Miller, one of the engineers who perished with the Titanic. Uh, it then goes on to say a little bit about the, the court proceedings and the fact that the £300 was split between them. £300 is a, quite a considerable sum for 1912. And um, this, I believe, came from what's called Workmen's Compensation, the Workmen's Compensation Act. So Tommy's union dues and his um, position within Harland and Wolf previously, and then the White Star Line would have meant that uh, his 
um, dependents would have been cared for with this 300 pounds. So that's part of it. This is more difficult to read, uh, but it is a letter from the National Disasters Relief Fund and uh, talks about their case number and what they were entitled to when they were young boys. So it tells us that each of the boys received between them five shillings and five pence, which then uh, was uh, brought down to two shillings and nine pence when Tommy Jr. became 16. And that small reliance was pay paid right up until my grandfather's 16th birthday. So I guess that was handy for Mary to put some shoes on their feet and maybe a few bits of meat into the, the stew that she was giving them. Uh, I think what's happened here is that my grandfather got curious as to what, if anything, he had been entitled to as a Titanic orphan. So he made his inquiries and having found out that he was on the list of the National Disasters Relief Fund, the Titanic Fund, he then made an application to it as late as 1950 here. Uh, where he must have been between jobs as a playwright, author, whatever all else he was doing. And he applied to them and was made a grant of £200, as was his brother. And you'll notice that it says in full and final settlement, um, just at the end of the first paragraph there. In other words, go away and please don't bother us again with your, um, <laughs> your uh, missives. I would have thought by 1950 that the Titanic Fund was wrapping up, but no, I've seen letters from the 60s, uh, which are still giving out uh, from that fund. So interesting that even all those years later, it was still paying out. So I promised to take you back to the, the cottage at Bonnie before, and here it is, um, because I want to show you the day that a blue plaque was unveiled to my grandfather, Ruddick Miller. And uh, this is as many of the family that we could get together including his daughter, Gillian, here in uh, the front row, uh, myself and my sister. Um, so, yes, we, we wanted to unveil this plaque to, to my grandfather to not only commemorate his Titanic connections, but also the fact that he was a pretty successful author, writer, playwright, what have you, back um, right up into the 1950s. Quick sidebar, though, this lad here, who's standing with a purple scarf on, this is a, like a second cousin of mine, whose name is Marcus Calvert. He also became a marine engineer. And back in the early 90s, he was working for uh, a line called BNI uh, down in Dublin, where he was a test engineer for ferries. The engine of uh, one of these ferries blew up on a November night uh, in Dublin Bay. And he was catapulted along with about five or six others into the dark waters. Um, and as he was waiting to be winched out by a helicopter with his life jacket on, he was thinking to himself, here we go again. Here's another Miller who's going to lose their life at sea. Now, he makes that story last half an hour. So I've given you the very much abridged version of what is actually a, a very interesting tale. But anyway, um, here's the blue plaque. Ruddick Miller, um, he wrote under the name Ruddick, although he was known as Billy uh, to his family. And his dates, 1907 to 19, 1952. He didn't live that long because he had a bad heart and his achievements. But what's more significant is what's written in the Celtic script along uh, the outline of this plaque. Two pennies bright, a starlit night, and on the other side, a cold, calm tide. Reference back to those two pennies that my grandfather was given by his father just before he sailed on Titanic with the words, don't spend them until we're all together again. Of course, that family never was together again. And my grandfather made the decision uh, when he heard that his father wasn't coming back and he wasn't going to be reunited, that he would keep those pennies with him all of his life. And that he did. He used to carry them around with him um, in his pocket. And uh, the first time that he went to London on the steamer and had to travel in a, a ship, he had them in his pocket as well for good luck. So um, when he died, he gave them to my father and uh, they were never really talked about in our family. My father used to keep them in a little velvet bag and never really refer to them. And it was only when I was about eight years old uh, that he gave me the book to read uh, that I have been quoting to you from this evening. And he showed me the pennies and told me the story of my grandfather, because at that stage, Belfast didn't talk about Titanic. It wasn't something that we mentioned at all. Very different today. But um, when I was growing up, it just wasn't something that was ever mentioned in the city of Belfast. And there are reasons for that, which I can go into if we have time. But anyway, um, he my, my father eventually then had them framed up and they did make it onto the wall of our family home. And uh, then 
when I started to get involved in all things Titanic, that's when they were um, put on loan to, to various um, <coughs> Titanic attractions around the world. And that's why uh, they find themselves in California at the moment in Catalina. So even though Tommy never made it across the Atlantic, you know, the pennies, the pennies definitely did. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think he would have never thought that, that they would have been still around today, that his great granddaughter would be talking about him and that he, you know, those pennies would have come to symbolize uh, the ordinary story of an Ulster family. Just a few memorials to Tommy then. His body was never recovered, uh, but his name was added to his wife's gravestone, which is in Carrickfergus in County Antrim, not far from Bonnie before. And uh, then he's also on this, which is the Titanic Memorial at Belfast City Hall. It got a good clean up for the centenary back in uh, 2012. And uh, that's what it says on the front, erected to the imperishable memory of those gallant Belfast men whose names are here inscribed. And he is there, Thomas Miller, fourth from the top on the white star side. And you see above him there, you've got Henry Philip Creese, with whom he worked uh, very closely. And it's funny that I've got to know a lot of these people and you know, their descendants in, the, in Belfast, uh, in particular, the Creese family and uh, McQuillan family. This lady here um, is re related to the last guy there, William McQuillan, who was a fireman on board Titanic. He's the only one whose body was recovered and identified and, as Dee will know, is buried in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And um, this is his granddaughter, Marjorie. The McQuillan family didn't know until quite recently, until within the last 10 or 12 years, that uh, he had been given a proper grave in Halifax because the letter telling them that never arrived uh, back in 1912. And so it was only when she was watching a, a television report by an, a, news, a, a television reporter back in Belfast who happened to hone in on that particular name, being a, a Northern Irish name. And she was sitting at home and, and saw that and realised that her grandfather had a, a final resting place. So she has since been out to visit. And just to put a few faces to those names who are with my grandfather or great grandfather on that memorial, including Henry Creese there in the middle. Um, he's also on the Southampton Engineers Memorial, a very fine piece of sculpture. And there he is, Thomas Miller on the left hand side of the names. And of course, below him there are Thomas Andrews, the man who gave him that uh, reference, um, who also perished in the Titanic. And then finally, he's on this memorial. This is uh, the Engineers Memorial, which is at the um, Maritime Museum at Greenwich, just outside of London. Where unfortunately there, they've spelled his name wrong. That happens quite a bit um, to us Millers with an A. So we just have learned to live with it by now. Uh, so there he is. I'm nearly finished, but I just want to recap on, on what Gail was saying, that I was lucky enough to be one of those who was on board uh, the Balmoral for the uh, Titanic Memorial cruise back in 2012. I was lucky enough to be able to leave from Belfast on this ship um, to go to Southampton and then onwards over to uh, Halifax and then New York. And as many of you will know, this journey mirrored the dates uh, that Titanic was um, at sea. And uh, the idea being that we should be at the wreck site exactly 100 years afterwards. So I was able to do the reverse of what my grandfather had watched and stand on the bow here until we got out past um, Bonnie before <clears throat> on our way to Southampton. On board, um, a collection of relatives. This is a group that we got together who were all descended from those who had been on Titanic, uh, some who had survived and some who had not. And uh, But most of the people on board were just those who were very interested in, in all things Titanic and wanted to be a part of a very special occasion. So we spent a few hours in this grouping here, uh, just chatting to each other and wondering whether our particular people would have known each other during their short voyage together. Uh, these wreaths were prepared on behalf of everyone on board, designed to be biodegradable so that nothing permanent was left behind. Belfast City Council had asked me to bring something with me, but um, in the end, I wasn't allowed to because these three wreaths were, were the only things that were, were put down as a marker. The only reason you know you're in the right place is the navigation system of the ship. We had been delayed getting there. And in fact, there was some doubt uh, at the time as to whether we would get to the place in time. 
she probably had to turn back because one of the BBC cameramen on board got sick. So to get him off of the ship uh, caused us to be delayed. We had terrible weather getting uh, from Southampton to Cove. But once we got to the wreck site, it was or above the wreck site, it was absolutely flat calm the way it would have been 100 years earlier. You can see from this photograph just how still it is. Um, the other ship you can see is the Azamara Journey, which had come out from the other side of the Atlantic to meet us in the middle there. And it was very respectfully done. Uh, the whole thing was done with um, great respect for those who had lost their lives and very tastefully done. And uh, <clears throat> there's a shot of me at uh, the, the stern of the ship watching those wreaths that were cast into the dark waters there. I defy anybody not to be moved on that occasion, um, you know, even if you are slightly made of stone, because uh, this person behind me here with, with the beard, he's a Welsh tenor who was singing Nearer My God to Thee. So there wasn't a, a dry eye in the house, as you could imagine. But it was, a, you know, a lovely way to pay tribute to my great grandfather. Um, but for me, that wasn't the important thing. Um, yes, it was important to be at the wreck site 100 years um, earlier, beyond um, Titanic's loss. But it was the arrival in New York City, which was the important thing to me, to be able to see this lady at the entrance to New York Harbour and to complete the journey for my great grandfather, uh, which he did not get to, to complete, obviously, back in 1912. So that was the, the emotional moment for me was to step off onto the, the pier in Manhattan and sort of mentally say to myself, right, Tommy, that, that's completed for you. Um, a very different view um, from 10 years ago. Things have, have changed uh, quite a bit since 2012 on that New York skyline. But uh, just to, to, to see that and to, to complete that journey was just such an important part of uh, it all for me. And it doesn't end there because the final thing, as Gail alluded to in the introduction, was that uh, last November, um, this house, which belonged to Roderick Chisholm, the, the chief draftsman of Titanic, it had come up for the sale in uh, the September. No, well, during the summer anyway. And um, we moved in last November because once I saw it on the market, we were hoping to move house anyway. And it just had to happen. It was just too good of a, a symmetry uh, to not be able to, to live in the house that, that was lived in by Roderick Chisholm. He was one of the guarantee group of Titanic, so he travelled on it and uh, was hoping to be back to his wife and, and son and daughter within a few weeks, probably three weeks. But as you may know, none of the guarantee group of Harlem's and Wolves survived, so he also was a, a victim of that night. And um, I spent a little while talking to his great-granddaughter about the house. Obviously, she doesn't remember it, but um, memories from her mother and her grandmother about Roderick and about what was where in the house and about what he used to do. And she's given me all sorts of photographs of him. So it's been great to make that connection. And certainly last um, April 15th and, and April 2nd, the day when Titanic left, I was thinking about, about Roderick and about his family and what was to, to lie ahead of them. So th this is a house in East Belfast, uh, an area called Sanford Avenue, and they've actually put it in the pavement, a little plaque to Roderick Chisholm, just to mark that uh, he... Uh, lived in that street and uh, that he was was at one of the guarantee group of Harland and Wolf. So I suppose that brings it up to, to the present day. Um, I hope that you've um, had a chance maybe to, to read the book and if you haven't that you know it, it will give you a, a sort of different spin on it now that you've heard all of the the background to it and how it came about and uh, if you're interested in what my grandfather wrote, his stuff is available um, digitally as well. It's long out of print nowadays, but he wrote quite extensively in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. And so some of his stuff is, is still out there as well. So um, I guess that brings me to an end. So I am going to stop sharing. And there I am back in vision for you, hopefully. And um, I'm happy to, to take any questions that you, you might have put into the chat. So I'll, I'll throw it back to you folks at, at uh, Catalina and uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you very much for, for being such an attentive audience in the meantime. Thank you, Susie. And if anybody has any questions, you can let us know in the chat or you can simply unmute yourself and ask your question.
I know there were great um, comments in the um, chat about how wonderful and moving these stories were, uh, Susie. Uh, you've had the cover of the book behind you uh, this whole time. And so most people probably made the connection of the story, but you might want to just point out what that is. Sure. <laughs> just give me one second again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm call. Perfect so timing. <laughs> I'm just gonna mute myself. One That's second. okay. For those of you who um, we shipped out some of the books of people who had ordered them when they signed up, and the others that we got um, within yesterday and mostly today, we'll ship those out on Monday. So um, you'll get those pretty quickly, uh, so you can read the full story. Uh, they are all signed by Susie from when she was here um, in November visiting, and so uh, you'll have that as well as part of uh, your book. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I hate to be ignorant, but could you please explain how the Titanic was lost? Sure. <clears throat> um, in the simplest of terms, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> she was going through an ice field in the middle of the night far too quickly. Uh, uh, I sound as if I'm getting choked up about this, but it's uh, just my throat, sorry. Um, she wasn't uh, designed for speed. She was designed for luxury and uh, for the amount of people that she could carry. But uh, yeah, she struck ice at a time when really she shouldn't have. Um, it was late enough in the season for her not to uh, encounter ice, but, but she did. And uh, the damage was so bad that um, many of her watertight compartments were just ripped open like a tin can and water started to pour in. And uh, it was more than the pumps could handle. So within uh, two hours and 20 minutes of hitting that iceberg, she had, had sunk. Uh, there were not enough lifeboats on board for all the passengers and crew. Uh, there were enough to meet the regulations of the day, but not to, uh, to handle the 2,200 souls that were on board. And so uh, <clears throat> we have about uh, 1,500 odd uh, that were lost and about seven, just over 700 people who were, were saved and put onto those lifeboats and then brought into New York by a ship called the Carpathia. So um, that explains it in the, in the simplest of terms, but there are many, many uh, theories as to who was to blame, uh, what could have been done differently. Uh, there's a, a wealth of literature out there, which we, we'll add to that story. Um, Aaron Walsh is asking where the pennies will go next. Where will the pennies go next? Um, and I see D in, in Halifax there was, was popping up as well. Um, <clears throat> they will go back to uh, Branson, Missouri. Many of the artifacts which are um, uh, on display in, in the Catalina Museum at the moment are on loan uh, from a company which has a couple of Titanic attractions, one in Branson, Missouri, and one in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And, um, excuse me one second. They have been on loan to, to both of those places um, since about 2012. So the plan is um, after the exhibition closes in February that they will go back to Branson um, for the next couple of years, I believe. You know, every couple of years, we as a family have a discussion and we'll say, you know, are you happy that they're still on loan or do you want them to come back to the family? Um, but our feeling is, you know, this way, Tommy's story gets out to a worldwide audience and uh, therefore it's probably the best place rather than hanging on one of our walls or for me to, to show to, to tour groups that I take around, uh, that this way they, they're seen by a much wider audience. So we're, we're happy to, to share them with you. Thank you so much. Um, April, who is actually our next speaker for our February 1st Friday, um, the 4th, she's asking when um, the exhibit will end here at the museum and it will close here at the museum. 
um, the Catalina, Catalina Museum for Art and History on um, February 13th. Oh, Dee, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, we'll take your question. Okay, I was actually just writing a little note in the chat there. It's great to see you, Susie, and to see all who are here tonight. I'm a fellow president, president of the Titanic Society. I'm in Halifax. And it was a pleasure to meet Susie in 2015 at the convention there and to have her sign my book while we were chatting at the, uh, actually at City Hall, I think. And uh, it's, it was just, a, just such a pleasure. And thank you so much for all the information you provided. You mentioned the lady who was the descendant of the fireman. Um, I'd love to connect with her. I'd love to know more about what she's learned and be able to provide maybe more information, photos, and maybe get the chance to meet her if she comes back to Halifax. My question is going to be, what, what, how many places have the pennies been so far? <laughs> the pennies um, have been to three, three places. Yeah, three. So uh, what happened was I, I was doing um, uh, an exhibition back in about 2011 at uh, Grand Central Terminal in New York City with Tourism Ireland uh, when we were promoting all that, that um, Northern Ireland was going to do to promote Titanic and to finally uh, tell the story of the, the backstory of the ship. And when I was there, I was approached by a guy called Paul Burns, who's the curator of all these museums. And he was interested to hear the story and was just blown away by the fact that I still had the pennies. And so from there, uh, they then went to, to Pigeon Forge in Tennessee and then to Branson, Missouri and currently then on loan to, to Catalina. So that's the furthest west that they've been so far. So just those three places. Uh, but yes, just circling back to the lady whose grandfather was the fireman. Um, it, it's a fascinating story because um, not only did the uh, letter telling the McQuillan family about his, his burial in Halifax never arrive with them, uh, neither did some of his possessions. Uh, his shaving kit, for example, things like that, which they had sent back to the family. So, you know, somewhere in a sorting office, somewhere in the world, those items are maybe sitting, who knows? But yes, um, uh, Marjorie is, she went to Australia for a while, and but she came back and she's still living in the Greater Belfast area. And she normally comes to our 15th of April commemoration, which we have at the memorial. We haven't been able to do it, obviously, the last couple of years. But uh, who knows, with a bit of luck and a fair wind behind us, we can, we can do it this year. But I am in contact with her, so I'll, I'll try and, and get the two of you hooked up, Dee. That would be wonderful. I probably even had, she had probably even saw her, but didn't know who she was at the memorial service in 2015. It's possible, right? I may have her in photographs, but I would love that. Thank you, Susie. I really appreciate it. And I'd be neat if the two pennies could come here to Halifax someday. Too. <laughs> we'll work on that. Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, Dave Gardner who wants to ask a question. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and then we'll go to Catherine Wu who has two questions in the comments. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Susie, for your wonderful presentation. I was not aware that you were ever actually at the Grand Central show. I actually, we may have engaged each other and not known it because I picked this up there. I don't exactly recollect who I spoke to, but it may have been you. So we may have met earlier than we recollect. Uh, anyway, my question is a bit off topic, but I had uh, taken your wonderful Belfast tour and you had taken me to the house of Thomas Andrews. And I remember at the time it was a uh, FIFA was occupying it and then it was up for sale or something like that. Do you know what the status is now? Is it still in the soccer club or somebody else? Um, it, it isn't now uh, because <clears throat> the Irish Football Association, when they built a big stadium, they moved out a couple of years ago. And mm. after a big refurb, uh, it was taken over by a charity called Action Cancer. So they're a fundraising and also a um, provide some some therapies there as well and they were good enough to let me maintain that relationship where I could take people to Thomas Andrews old home good. and uh, obviously with, with with COVID things have been out of action for the last couple of years uh, but hopefully in the not too distant future I'll be taking people back in there they've done a lovely job of, of doing it up um, the, the football association were very proud of their um, link to Titanic but 
Action Cancer have also taken up that mantle and been very keen to try to match carpet uh, colours and um, other colour schemes to what they would have been in Thomas Andrews' time. So yes, it's still possible to to access um, that old house, Dunallen, as it's called in South Belfast. Oh, great. Well, access is great. And also that was when I was able to pick up and purchase this wonderful book of yours as well. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you, Dave. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Uh, okay, Catherine Wu, if you are ready to unmute, you can go right ahead and ask your question. Okay, I am not showing my face because I'm already in bed. <laughs> That's quite all right. Thanks for joining. joining. <laughs> Hi, Susie. I uh, really, really was very touched by your story. And um, particularly at the very end when you said that... Um, that the touching part was when you saw Lady Liberty. Yeah. And that you, you, you were able to finish the journey that your great grandfather was not able to. I mean, that just brought tears to my eyes because it is really very, very moving. Yes. Uh, um, so you, um, let's see. I, I guess that is mostly what, uh, what I wanted to say also. I didn't know if I heard it correctly. You and your husband bought the place that Mr. Chisholm, or I don't remember his last name, uh, the family's home. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And you have it right. His name was Roderick Chisholm. He was the chief draftsman of uh, mm -hmm. Titanic. So he would have worked very closely with, with Thomas Andrews, who we were just talking about. And he travelled as part of this guarantee group that Harland and Wolf would put together um, on the, the maiden voyage of ships just to make sure that everything ran smoothly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, when his house came up for sale um, 18 months ago, <clears throat> we just happened to be looking for somewhere, a, a change of, of address. And uh, yeah, we you know, just had to have it, you know. <laughs> oh my, that is so Great good. Connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and I yeah. also, yeah, and I also put in the chat that I have, I actually met your husband oh. because we we went on, I saw him oh. when he oh. was trying to help you <laughs> because <laughs> we were on the, the tour, Rick Steve's tour to the Adriatics and, oh. and he, yeah, and he was a great photographer. I remember meeting him once before in, in the dining room, way before uh, breakfast. I was asking some tips about photography. Yeah. Okay. So, and then wow. later on, he put in the Facebook that he met this lovely lady. <laughs> so, yeah. So <laughs> I can see you. why I, I can see why he fell for you. <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if your uh, people are, are familiar with um, a company called Rick Steves Europe, and you might know Rick Steves from TV shows. He does travelogues, he writes guidebooks. So I actually work for him as a tour guide in Ireland, and that's where I met my my husband. He was an unwilling victim. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was the tour that that we went um, on the Adriatic. Rick Steves tour. Yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful tour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, say hi to David. I think he might remember me. <laughs> yes, yes, he's he's nodding his head. So yes, he okay, does good. I can't show my face because I'm already in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank um, you for, for tuning in tonight. It's it's lovely to yeah, you. yeah, and 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 um, so it is so moving, so interesting uh, to hear about you know the story of. I think you said Ulster, right? Where you're from, the town or the area in Ireland in, in, near oh, Belfast. Ulster is is Ulster. Um, Oh, okay. It's a sort yeah. of shorthand term for for Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I've only been to Northern Ireland once, and I remember being in Belfast. And also, oh, wasn't there some kind of rocks? I forgot the name. That uh, will be the Giant's Causeway, I think. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. But thank anyway, you. thank you. <laughs> thank Come you very Catherine. much. <laughs> uh, okay. So Dawn is asking if you had the two pennies with you on your cruise into New York. I didn't. No, I think by that stage, I think they were all, excuse me, they were already in, um, in Branson. Although I'm, I'm not 
100 percent clear about the the timeline of it i will share with you though if you promise to keep it a secret that um on board uh were some friends from belfast and in, indeed a a guy who's who's a committee member with with us on belfast titanic society and just as we were sort of circling um the area where titanic you know was obviously directly below us um he came up to me and he said i have something for you and he gave me a 1912 penny that he had spe specifically brought wow. and he said you know what to do with that <clears throat> and so when no one was looking i, I just dropped it in I remember we weren't supposed to leave anything behind or take anything away, hence the biodegradable wreaths and all of that. So I kind of broke the rules a little bit there, but um, I just thought it was sort of symbolic to do that. So mm -hmm. I promise not to tell anybody. That's what um. happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Susie. I don't see uh, any more questions in the chat, but I would like our viewing room to put up um, the slide for our next first Friday, which will be with April. She's joining us tonight uh, and she will be speaking about Old Hollywood um, and that'll be on Friday, February 4th, 6 p.m. and it will also be on Zoom. Thanks to everyone who uh, joined us tonight. Uh, we're so thrilled to have this audience and to have Susie, join us and tell us these amazing and uh, heartwarming and just uh, loved hearing about Thomas's wife and her spirit and uh, just so many things that relate to the family and how this um, tragedy really, you know, formed and shaped so many lives. And so it was really wonderful to hear that. And so if you haven't uh, seen the book, get it. We have it at the museum. They're signed by Susie and um, otherwise get it in other places. We don't care, we just want you to have it and read it. And uh, we just are so thankful to everyone who joined us and to Susie and her husband for sure. We actually have one more question from Jill. Oh, great. Sorry, I'm slow. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And I was curious about the castle in the background. Does that have a meaning in, on the back of your book there? Yeah, uh, Jill, the castle is, is Carrick Fergus Castle, and um, it's an old Norman castle. It, it dates from 1180, so, you know, not that long ago. And uh, it, it's a real landmark in, in County Antrim. <laughs> um, so it's a place you can go and tour nowadays, but uh, yeah, a Norman Norman castle with a big keep there. Um, so it would always have been in my grandfather's eye line when he was, you know, looking out to sea. It would have been very um, prevalent in, in his little world there in the village of Bonnie before. So yeah, Carrick Fergus Castle. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Welcome. All right, well, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. We were so happy to have you all. And we hope to see you next first Friday, February 4th. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.